What's up, Coach Bach here. We are talking about the two mass model. If you are not familiar, it comes from this research paper, which has to do with estimating ground reaction force during sprinting without actually measuring the force. The two mass model has been making some rounds on social media. I've seen some content on it that indicates to me that people really do not understand it. I saw someone say that only elite sprinters can use the two mass model, which seems to indicate they think that it's a, a special sprint technique, which it is not. I saw someone say that sprinters create a secondary mass, which just is not what we're talking about. Uh, so I'm going to do my best to explain what the two mass model actually is and hopefully clear up some confusion. The two mass model is a method for estimating ground reaction force during sprinting without actually measuring the force. All right, and it is an updated and upgraded way of doing that compared to previous attempts. So for example, did you know that if you just have air time and ground time from a sprint, you can calculate the, well, one, the vertical impulse that's generated on a foot contact, and then using the contact time, you can easily calculate the average force, the average vertical force during that contact. And then if you take that impulse and you just shape it into uh, just a, like a modified sine graph, that's actually one way of estimating what that vertical force signature would look like. Now, that could be pretty accurate if you just have a symmetrical sine curve type of force signature. But of course, not all force signatures are just symmetrical sine curves. So what the two mass model does is it gives us a little bit better ability to predict forces when it is not just following a symmetrical sine curve. Here's some examples from the research paper. You can see that the predicted force signature using the two mass model lines up pretty well with the actual measured force signature. Even is pretty accurate when you have people heel striking versus forefoot striking. It can pick up on all of that. And it's with a relatively small amount of motion capture data that it, that it requires. So that's why this is notable and impressive. The data required to do this is simply air time, ground time, and then motion capture data on the lower leg. Specifically, I think the visual marker is on the inside of the ankle. So they're tracking the movement of really the foot through space and specifically the downward velocity at the ground and then the deceleration on the ground is very important data that goes into this model here. So in the method where you just have air time and ground time, then you're basically just considering the body to be one mass bouncing off the ground and then you can get that sine curve, okay? But that's limited in its accuracy. In the two mass model, you're considering the body to be two masses, which is the foot and lower leg and then everything else. It's collecting data on those two masses using that to estimate two different impulses on the ground and combining those impulses to generate a predictive vertical force signature. And that's why it's called the two mass model. So to reiterate, the two mass model is a method for estimating vertical ground forces or vertical ground force signature without actually measuring the forces. And it applies to different levels of athletes running at very different speeds and even using different techniques, okay? The two mass model is not a sprint technique itself. It is not some secret thing that elite sprinters are doing in order to sprint faster. It is a method for estimating ground force. Now, what elite sprinters do that is unique is they generate more force specifically in the first part of ground contact. So their vertical force signature is skewed to the left. They have this steep spike in the beginning of that force curve. And we know this from the simple spring stance mechanics paper. All right. Now what the 
two mass model paper does is it helps us understand how elite sprinters do that in the two mass model everyone has two masses everyone has two impulses associated with those masses but for elite sprinters impulse one is distinctly quick and distinctly steep in that rising edge so it shows up in the first part of ground contact as that early spike in the force signature and that's because the motion tracking data reveals that their foot is going down at the ground faster and then decelerating faster when it hits the ground so that's why their impulse one stands out from other people's so does this reveal a technique that we can use to sprint faster well it certainly does bring to mind the concept of hammering the nail right people have been talking about this for decades like you got to pick your foot up and you got to throw it down into the track like hammer the ground in order to generate that force right and yeah i mean i can't blame people for seeing this paper seeing this data and saying like yeah that's that's how we got to sprint faster now in practice though i i don't know how much success people have by just consciously trying to hammer their feet into the ground right in fact i can say for certain that a lot of people have negative experiences associated with attempting that uh, whether it be running slower, causing pain, uh, et cetera. So what, what's the deal there? Like, why can't we just go out there and throw our feet into the ground harder and sprint faster? I think the key thing we have to realize is that the data includes, yes, downward velocity of the foot, but also deceleration when you hit the ground, all right? And we're talking about the, the inside of the ankle there. So, you know, the collapse of the foot and pronation like that type of thing is going to be is going to be captured in there and the quickness of that process is going to be tied to leg stiffness okay and so what i think is that you don't want to do the downward velocity part if you can't do the faster deceleration part on the ground and in order to do that, you have to have the leg stiffness. And that leg stiffness, I think, is not really a technique. It's more of a physical quality, okay, that has to be developed. So the reason that elite sprinters can do this is because their leg is just different than other people, right? If you just take some average person and you have them like slamming their feet into the ground harder, all they're gonna get is more collapse, a slower deceleration, and then, you know, probably the focus on that versus the focus on just sprinting fast is going to mess with their coordination as well. And so the end result generally is not pretty. Okay. So that's what I think. I think the leg stiffness, or I, I like to use the term elasticity too, because stiffness itself is just resistance to deformation. Um, it's not necessarily a good bounce off the ground. That's why I like to use the term elasticity because elasticity refers to a quick bounce off the ground. And so I think it's, you know, the stiffness and elasticity, that's kind of the, the linchpin, right? That's like what everything is depending on. And if you don't have that, you can't do the other pieces because everything is all connected and reliant on each other. So that's why I don't think that this really reveals like a speed hack for us. Okay. It definitely helps us understand how elite sprinters are achieving what they're doing. But there's a piece in there that you can't replicate just by changing your technique. There's a piece in there, a really important piece, I think, that you have to just develop with training your ass off for a long time. All right. So I wish that the two mass model revealed a secret speed hack for us. I don't know if it does. I think in the end it comes down to like, yeah, you got to physically develop your body really effectively. And it's going to take a lot of work over a lot of years in order to do that. Now, that certainly does not mean that you should not experiment with sprint technique, right? You just have to keep in mind that technique is supported by physical development.